three or four times now, and um, really appreciating the chance to get better acquainted with all of you. Last week, the common lectionary, this set of readings, weekly readings that the church universal reads together, not every congregation, but many congregations are reading together week by week. Last week, Romans 7, this week, Romans 8. And Romans 8 has been considered by many maybe the richest chapter, the meatiest chapter of all of Paul's writings. So we'll sample a little bit this morning. And may grace <clears throat> abide in our hearts as we attend to the words. There is therefore now, Paul writes, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of spirits of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. There's a lot of dense theology in that passage. that I'm not going to get into. <laughs> um, this passage is best preached. It will be best preached in about a six-week sermon series. Just So <clears throat> that's not what we're going to do today. I was struck <clears throat> by how many times the word spirit appears in this text and the word flesh appears in this text. So I counted. Spirit, the word spirit appears 11 times in this text. Law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Walk according to the spirit. Live according to the spirit. Things of the spirit. To set the mind on the spirit. You are in the spirit. The spirit of God dwells in you. Spirit of Christ. The spirit is life. Spirit of him who raised Christ. Spirit that dwells in you. 
I count the mention of flesh 10 times in the passage. And remember here, when you're reading Paul and you see the word flesh, as we have come to appreciate the Greek, flesh refers to our egocentric outlook, our self-centered impulses. It doesn't necessarily mean meat and bones. (laughs) So spirit 11, Flesh, 10. Spirit wins by a nose. But this is the gospel, isn't it? When all is said and done, spirit outruns, outlasts flesh. Grace exhausts self-centeredness. Love vanquishes fear, the divine rest pacifies every restless heart. Spirit is relentless, friends. My friend Bob Hill, your friend too? I know you're well acquainted with him. Bob Hill years ago was welcoming a group of folks to worship, I think maybe for a regional assembly. And he stood up to begin the service of worship and he said, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Spirit is relentless. That's the gist of what Paul is getting at in this passage, I think. He's laying out a theological case for this, which is dense and fascinating, but the exuberant enthusiasm of this passage, and indeed all of Paul's writing, just exuberant writing, this is what endears us to Paul. When we read Paul, we're we're reading the testimony of a person who is discovering the pure joy of a liberation, little by little from his self-centered self, his egoic self. It's intoxicating to him, and we pick that up. And this life, ever-deepening life in Christ, is an intoxicating joy, a journey of discovery of the depths of Christ's life in us. Spirit is relentless. Now, Isaiah and the prophets lamented the sin of our self-centered condition. Isaiah writes one of his more famous lines, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to their own way. Handel's Messiah has a lovely rendering of that line, which I will not sing for you, but you should Google it. It's lovely. You can find clips of it on YouTube. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to their own way. Then six centuries after Isaiah, here comes Jesus striding out of his wilderness experience, having reckoned with the question, which way will he turn? Which way will he choose, flesh or spirit? This is the choice Satan is giving him in the desert. Jesus comes out of that wilderness experience, and the first words he speaks, the time is fulfilled. He says, 
The kingdom of God is at hand, he says. These are words spoken from a heart that had found its freedom from flesh, from self-centeredness. These are words spoken from a heart that has found a vibrant freedom in the spirit. This is Jesus coming out of the desert. The kingdom, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Then he says to each of us who like sheep have turned to our own way, He tells us what we need to do. Repent, he says, which can be translated, turn, change direction, turn from your own way to the gospel way of spirit. Turn, pivot from flesh to spirit. Spirit is relentless, friends, like a puppy you've brought home, and you're sitting there on the patio, and the new puppy brings you his tennis ball, drops it at your feet, and waits. Spirit is relentless. You're going to throw that ball eventually. Right? And we've all seen something like this. Green leafy shoots emerging out of rocky surfaces or cracks in the concrete. I was walking on a friend's driveway several months ago. It's a kind of a crushed gravel driveway right in the middle of this driveway. One beautiful, tiny, bright, yellow flower. Spirit is relentless, friends. When we have a sense of this truth, and I'm not sure you can read scripture responsibly without grasping this truth, that spirit is relentless. When we have a sense of this truth, the invitation God in Christ offers us then is to consent, give way, set your minds on the presence and activity of this relentless spirit in your heart. Paul has glimpsed the payoff here of doing this when he says to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. You're not gonna get those things going your own way only spirit's way is the way of life and peace and life and peace not as we might imagine it and we can imagine can you imagine a fabulous life can you imagine an amazing peace but this life and this peace paul is talking about is not as we can Imagine it's as God can imagine for us and for the human family. So here's a story that'll be a closing this morning that gets at a lot of this. Once upon a time, in a land not so far away, I'm stealing this from. Jacob Needleman. Once upon a time in a land not so far away, 
There was a kingdom of acorns settled at the foot of a grand old oak tree. Since the citizens of this kingdom were modern, fully westernized acorns, they went about their life with a purposeful energy. And since they were midlife baby boomer acorns, they engaged in a lot of self-help courses. There were seminars called Getting All You Can Out of Your Shell. And who would you be without your nutty story? There were woundedness and recovery groups for acorns who had been bruised in their fall from the tree. There were spas for oiling and polishing those shells and various acorneopathic therapies to enhance longevity and well-being. One day, in the midst of this kingdom, there suddenly appeared a naughty, K-N-O-T-T-Y, a naughty little stranger, apparently dropped out of the blue by a passing bird. He was capless and a dirty acorn, making an immediate negative impression on his fellow acorns. And to make things worse, crouched beneath the mighty oak tree, he stammered out a wild tale, pointing up at the oak tree. He said to the other acorns, we are that. Delusional thinking, obviously, the other acorns concluded. But one of them continued to engage him in conversation. So tell us, how would we become that tree. Well, said he, pointing downward, it has something to do with going into the ground and cracking open the shell. Insane, they responded. Totally morbid. Why, then we wouldn't be acorns anymore. Amen. <laughs>